We respectfully request the Sangha Great Virtues for the sake of this assembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach and guide us how to end birth and death, leave suffering and attain bliss, and quickly realize non-birth. Kung din dai tang tin Vì thứ pha bội cập nhật thiết chủng sanh Tình chiến diệu pha luân giao đạo ngã mùng Như há liệu sanh thoát tư How much of the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one? Namo Sadanto, Sucedo Ye La Hudi Samyao San Puto Sye. Namo Tatakta to Yada Ya La Hadi Tamyo Tambo Da Doa. The unsurpassed, profound, subtle, and wonderful Dharma in hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I'm able to see and hear, I will receive and maintain it. I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual principles. Wu shang sheng sheng wei miao fa ba hi chen Wan chie nan zao yu Wo jin jie wen de shou chu Yuan chie ru lai zhe shi yi O Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Great Master, Ching Liang, Great Master Shin Hua, O good monks and nuns, and all good known advisors of me, To Fo, Chu Fo Pu Sa, Ching Liang Ta Shi, Shi Fu Shang Ren, Ge Wei, Chu Cha Ren, Ge Wei, Shang Chi Shi, Mi To Fo. Chi Phật Bồ Tát, Khân Thưa, Thân Lương Đại Sư, Thượng Tiên Hóa, Quý Thầy Cô và Quý Vị Thịnh Chi Thức A Nhi Đà Phật. Hello everyone, today is the 19th already of April 2024. We're here at the Wei Mountain Temple to continue discussing the uh, um, prologue to the Avatamsaka Sutra. Just one comment before we start the lecture. Uh, actually, this is the start of the lecture. Uh, all right, as you, some of you may have known, I just came back from K-Land. K-Land, it's like K-Mart, K-Land. Never dawned on me until tonight, it's K-Mart, K-Land. <laughs> they have no K-Mart there. Everything's uh, um, so nice. Anyway, uh, I just came back from K-Land and um, and um, on the airplane, on the way back, it's an it's a EVA airline, okay, not EVA, okay, EVA airline stopped by Taipei uh, uh, and to support the Taiwanese. Uh -huh, uh -huh. A little bit. But while I was there, I was so scared. I thought, is China going to attack? <laughs> <laughs> if they do, I'm going to be in big trouble. <laughs> I have lectures to make. <laughs> Cannot afford to be stuck here. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, so, you know. So, 
the interesting experience I want to relate to you that I cannot, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I want to do tonight before I forget, number one, I'm getting forgetful, as you probably noticed, uh, and, uh, and there's no photos at all. Uh, so if you have photos, I forget even quicker. But anyway, on the way back, okay, the, the lake from Taipei back here is about 12 hours and uh, is economy class. And this time here, for some reason, my section is full of Vietnamese, from old to young. There's a kid who sits right, right behind me, he kicks me and he touches me, <laughs> nonstop. <laughs> okay, the dad's pretty nice. Uh, actually, he doesn't make any noise, he just, he just moves and fidgets and like kids normally do. They can't stay still. Um, and uh, and uh, but luckily for us, uh, it's not he's not loud. He doesn't cry at all. He doesn't make a lot of noise. So at least it's bearable. Okay, kicking and you know that kind of thing. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's a three rows, uh, three seat uh, section, three seat, three seats, three seats like that in this uh, uh, Airbus whatever. Okay, and so I had the aisle seat. And so next to me is an old Vietnamese couple. Okay? Uh, and so this Vietnamese couple here, uh, of course, he's short. You know. <laughs> and, uh, and the hair is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, salt, pepper, that kind of thing. And so the man sits next to me, and the woman sits uh, by the window. And uh, 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 I don't say, it's, I didn't say a single word of Vietnamese, but I could understand what everyone around me was, was, were, was talking about. What's interesting thing to me is that it's a very tiring thing. You know, 12 hours and, you know, uh, he's older, so he sleeps most of the time. And then, you know, it's a very, econom economy seats is designed for uh, Asians. <laughs> I don't recommend you, Caucasian, to take economy at all. Okay, you need two. Look at you, some you need two seats. <laughs> I mean, so even though he's, you know, he fits in, I and you know, my shoulder a little bit wider. <laughs> so, but anyway, so he he's fine in his seat. But when he sleeps, and then you know, his blankets and stuff would encroach my space, you know. And for a monk, you don't want to do that to a monk, you know. It's not polite. <laughs> I'm supposed to be up here, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so, so the cool thing is that uh, he really behaved himself. He wanted to keep to his side, okay. But occasionally he would encroach on my space. But we never exchanged a single word, okay. Uh, but... After that time, the entire trip there dawned on me something interesting, that they're extremely respectful to a monk who's not even, this is not even Vietnamese, doesn't speak to them at all. They're extremely respectful. Let me tell you, this couple here, Okay. When they, they went out to go to the restroom twice, for 12 hours, they were held back until towards the end. Okay? And whenever they went out, they always like this, and you know, they move by very fast, they apologize themselves, and so forth. Okay? They are so respectful the whole time. I was shocked. Why? Even my own master's disciples, trained monks, and lay people, I never could see any of them disrespectful towards a sangan, towards a foreign, a foreigner sangan. Never saw it before. Okay, even my own master's disciples, I was there for four years. I met them all. I met most of the monks and nuns. I met most of the lay people who are important supporters of the temple, none of them 
was as respectful as his old. Let me drop that uh, advert. <laughs> Vietnamese couple. I was so impressed. This is what reminded me of them. This one here, this side, slide. We respectfully request. That's how we start out in all the lectures. We respectfully request. I respectfully request. Me too, I mean. I respectfully request. Just like you, I also said, we respectfully request. Because I get help from the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas too. When I speak Dharma to you, I know that. I have, you know, I'm stupid. <laughs> what do you expect? Okay? Without their help, I cannot possibly speak Dharma to you. This profound Dharma, like the Avatamsaka Sutra, is so profound. It's a stuff for Bodhisattvas and Buddhas. And me trying to make sense out of it is, is impossible unless I get help. It's not the point. The point being this is so fundamental to Mahayana. You know how it all got started? Because... The heavenly king of the first dhyana and chakra knelt down in front of the Buddha and, and respectfully requested the Buddha to speak Dharma for them. This is the meaning of what we do, folks. It is so important, it is so profound, let me tell you. And, and this is what I saw in that old Vietnamese couple they are not very high level in samadhis. They haven't learned that much. But what they have is what I don't see in most Chinese, Indian, uh, 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 you know what I mean. <laughs> the kind of respect that they have by default. It's amazing. I never saw, never saw that before. In the place where the lion's den, in my master's temple, you think you find that, right? You think you learn that, right? No, they didn't get it. I want you to understand this. It's how important it is. Because unless you're respectful, the Dharma will not be given to you. The Buddha would not have taught us unless the first Yana uh, heaven king requested it with utmost sincerity. He knew it. He had to do it for our sakes. And Indra, or, 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 or the, the god, the, the, the Christian god king, this is why we have to be grateful to him, okay, as well, also knew it. And that's why they requested for our sake that bequeath teachings from the Buddha. And because of that, the Buddha had no choice but give it to us, our world. So without the proper Dharma request, it would have not ever happened. And what it takes is right here, respect. That's what I saw on that. Vietnamese couple. I never met people like that. It's very rare for me to see it. So rare, let me tell you. And you know, it takes so many blessings for you to have that kind of mindset. Because listen, with that mindset, because of that mindset, because of your Dharma request, the Dharma is given out so that it benefits countless living beings. Therefore, you are generating countless blessings for yourself, meaning that you have to have tremendous blessings beforehand before you can do that. Isn't it fascinating? It takes blessings to generate blessings, folks.
So unless you have a lot of blessings, you won't be able to have this kind of mindset respectfully request. I saw that in the couple. I was, I was so pleased. I was tickled pink because I was bitching. I mean, I was complaining to, to you say, why do we have to do this again? <laughs> I could ask my disciples, you know, can you help me get into a better section? But no, we had to choose to do it the hard way. And every time we travel, someone always encroaches my space. This time I'm better. I learned to withdraw my right shoulder so that the weight, the stewardess would not hit my shoulder <laughs> because I have, uh, you know, You know, <laughs> and I saw that in this Vietnamese couple, and the result is similar to what I saw in Korea. That's why we went to Korea, because of this respectful request for the Dharma. People thought I came to Korea because we wanted Korean money. Actually, we're losing money from the U.S., okay? Uh, but, uh, but, Someone respectfully requested the Dharma. That's why we went to Korea, let me tell you. Okay? It was not a casual thing at all. We've been in Korea for five years now because the Dharma was respectfully requested properly. Okay? And the same thing happened on that, that trip back to, to, uh, to uh, the U.S. here. Okay? A... As long as you have Buddhist disciples who are so respectful to Sasanga, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will come and teach you. It's one of the most important lessons I learned from this trip. It tickled me pink. Okay? It's so beautiful. They're so limited, they're so short, so old. And so respectful, incredible. And usually, you know, when you think that the Vietnamese, they only respect for their own monks and nuns. You know, the Koreans only respect their own Sunims. The Indians respect their own kinds only, but for them to cross boundaries and go into, because our clothes are not Vietnamese style. This is Chinese, Taiwanese Chinese. So they, I think, I don't think they, they, they thought I was Vietnamese at all, even though I have uh, Vietnamese features. <laughs> okay, we're getting distracted. <laughs> the point being that I don't think I came across as Vietnamese at all. When I was wearing Vietnamese clothes back back then, way back then, the Vietnamese, I was walking because I had no car, I walking, and the, some Vietnamese guy would swing over, make a U-turn, and ask me, would you like a ride, master? Twice. Okay. Now I imagine if I do it, I probably have more offers because I'm older. I walk with a hunch. It's so cool. You know, there's such people, but with this old Vietnamese here, couple, okay? And they're so afraid to do anything to, you know, to offend me, to encroach on my space, and so forth, and felt so uneasy to cause inconvenience for me to stand up to let them through twice. It's fascinating to me. There's such people exist among the Buddhists. And this is why Buddhism will always be here. As long as you have such people, the great Dharma will be transmitted to us. So tonight, I'd like to raise a glass to the, those such people, huh? respectful people, because it's beneficial for all of us. Cheers, cheers. Okay. Any questions? Because of that, Vietnamese abbots, you have your work cut out for you. I want you to work harder to benefit more on the Vietnamese, okay? 
because at that couple, there's such Buddhist disciples, Vietnamese Buddhist disciples here in the U.S. Therefore, it's our responsibility to try to benefit that community. Very much like I went to Korea because of some very respectful Korean disciples who requested our Dharma. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, let's learn some real Dharma instead of BSing. Okay, uh, we are on slide 796. Thank you all for coming and join us. Uh, let's see. It's been a while, over a month now, so that's, it doesn't matter at all. Okay. But uh, it's kind of remind you where we are. This is a prologue prepared by Master Ching Liang, which is a great overview of the Avatamsaka Dharma. So uh, it's worthwhile to go into it, and don't don't. You know, it's no big deal. You get it if you don't get it. The first time I read it, I didn't get any of it. Maybe five percent. Uh, uh, but uh, here, what he's talking about, he's he's a really great Buddhist scholar. He did a great survey of the Buddhist teachings. So he's now in the sixth section. It's on, uh, on uh, uh, door number two, which is uh, stores and the teachings. So he's, he's discussing the Indian Buddhism, Indian schools of Buddhism. Hmm. And so I, uh, I confess to you that I don't know much about Indian Buddhism at all. What I learned is Chinese Buddhism. Okay, but apparently, uh, apparently, Indian Buddhism has two major schools: Dharma Nature School and Dharma Mark Schools. And this is what happened to the Chinese monks of old, Master Xuanzang in particular. He went from China, made an arduous, long and arduous trip from China to India to learn about Mahayana, Indian Mahayana, and he brought it back. He was exposed to these two schools. And that's what we're learning. All right? Mm. All right, 796. Precept Worthy received his distant transmission from Maitreya and Asanga and his proximate transmission from Dhammapala and Nanda. Mm. Okay. When Master Xuanzang the Chinese monk, the famous Chinese monk, who is responsible for major transmission of Sanskrit or Indian Buddhism to, from India to China. He went there and over 14 to 16 years, he brought back a whole treasure of Indian Buddhism and that's the start of the great Chinese Mahayana. Okay. And that's because of his great wisdom and his great, he made great sacrifices and also the Chinese emperor's wisdoms. Emperors back then had such wisdom, that's why, that's what explains the depth and the greatness of the Chinese cultures. Because Mahayana became interwoven into the Chinese culture. Okay. And the great Mahayana was became interwoven in contrast to, for example, to Zen or Chinese, uh, J Japanese Buddhism. It's uh, not high level. That's why it's, it's uh, not as profound as Chinese Buddhism, in my humble opinion. Okay? So, Master Xuan Zhang, after a long trip from China to India, he, he made it. And he went to this uh, time, uh, uh, temp uh, temple, big temple called Nalanda Temple. Uh, it's the same name as a great university nowadays. You go to China, uh, to India, and you learn Buddhism. You go to this university, Nalanda University, nowadays. Okay, uh, a lot of uh, monks and nuns in Asia do that. They get a PhD and so forth. Uh, uh, but he went to this Nalanda temple. And the Nalanda temple is great because it has two great monks there 
who, was, who were the originators of the two great schools of Buddhism in India. Okay, and one uh, and one of them is uh, the two, the two the two great schools are Dharma Mark schools and Dharma Nature schools. Okay, so we're learning about this. Okay, this is for gen our general information. Okay, in his Dharma Mark school, uh, uh, that says Dharma Master Precept Worthy uh, received this distant transmission from Maitreya Bodhisattva. Okay, Maitreya Bodhisattva is the incoming Buddha, and he prepped the way for us already by, uh, by appearing in India and to start the Dharma Mark schools. Okay, he taught that and transmitted it to two very famous Bodhisattvas in India, Vasubandhu and Asanga. Okay, and uh, uh, they're brothers. Uh, they're both bodhisattvas, uh, and so so then from then on, mm, then on the, the the school thrived in India, and uh, that's when Master uh, Master uh, Precept Worthy, who is the teacher of Xuanzang, Great Master Xuanzang, uh, uh, time. He received the transmission of the teaching from Dharma Master, Dharma Pala, Dharma Protector, and Nanda. That's the lineage, if you will. And this is another concept in Buddhism. Uh, the, the, the apple doesn't fall very far from the trees, meaning that you, know, you want to learn the real profound stuff, you have to go to where the center or where the great teachers are. And that means the patriarchs. Okay? So these are the great, great teachers that you want to draw near. Okay? Uh, so uh, in our times, Master Xuanhua, uh, in our recent times, Master Xuanhua is a great known patriarch. He's gone now. Second patriarch is not that good. From my, from my humble opinion. And so that's why he's disappeared because they didn't have much to add to, to it. So he does his patriarch thing in you know, whatever he does, you know, who knows. Uh, but, uh, but so what you still want to do is go back to the source, go back to Master, Master Xinhua's teachings. You want to learn the real Mahayana stuff. Okay, I will go there first. Yeah, and uh, then go to our uh, a little bit uh, later. Okay, uh, you need to make sure you have the proper references. All right, uh, and uh, so the lineage is very important. Uh, so these Master uh, Xuanzang, uh, you see, that's the nature of the blessings. You have the blessing, you have access to the great teaching, the great teachers right away. Okay. He went there and he was drawn to this, to this, uh, this uh, temple and they, they approved of him uh, and uh, took care of him. Uh, 798, based upon such, such sutras as the deep secret and such shastras as yoga, yoga charya, he established three kinds of teachings which took the Dharma marks, the great vehicle, as the ultimate meaning. Those are precisely the teachings adopted by Tripitaka of Tang. Okay. So all these schools are founded upon the Buddha's teachings, and they would use their references, such as the Deep Secret uh, Sutra, uh, uh, Buddha Ground Sutra, uh, and some Shastras as, as commentaries made by the Bodhisattvas, uh, uh, such as Yoga Charya, uh, um, Bhumi Shastra, uh, by Maitreya, Pair Dharma Shastra uh, by Dharma Master 
Shisiramati, propagating a sage teaching shastra and so forth. So you have a list of all these great teachers, okay? Uh, and based on that, he established three kinds of teachings, okay? Uh, so uh, so that's, that's what the nature of the source of the teachings from the Dhamma Marx school, all right? One of the two schools in, 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 in the Indian Buddhism. Uh, 800 commentary slide. They took the Dharma marks, uh, Dharma Lakshana school, the great vehicles, the ultimate meaning. Mm. And, uh, uh, and this is precisely the teachings adopted by Tripitaka and Pastor Sri Inzang uh, of Tang Dynasty. Uh, and so he personally received the transmission of the Indian master, uh, precept worthy, and brought it back to China. So you see, so he came from uh, from the great uh, from the great sources. Very much like Master Shen Hua, even though before uh, he's an accomplished monk, what he did was to go to Master Xu Yun and receive certification so that he can officially become the patriarch of Chinese Buddhism. And then he then moved it to the U.S. So you see that this is a lineage of the Dharma that we learn from. It's very important to know that. And this is not available in the other branches of Buddhism, by the way. This is as close to the core of the teachings that you're going to find, where you find these patriarchs from this, this direct lineage, very much like Master Xuanzai got the transmission from the Dharma schools which originated from Maitreya Bodhisattva. You see that? So the reference is very, very important. Okay? Uh, and this is, uh, I can't stress this enough, that it's very important for you to check the references. Okay? Mm. You cannot go wrong. You go back to Master Shinhua, which is originated all the, through that lineage. Okay. Now the funny thing is this, Master Shenhua's case is slightly different because Master Shenhua became accomplished without Master Xu Yun's training. Actually, the reason being that if Master Shenhua was training, was to train under Master Xu Yun, he would not have been gone, gone up that, that high up. Because Master Xu Yun, when a teacher is limited, he will obstruct the pupil. Okay, so Master Shenhua had to cultivate by himself. And then after he's done, he went to see Master Xu Yun for our sakes, not for his sakes. Yes, nine. Master, I thought Master Xu Yun was enlightened. Yes, he was. But enlightenment has many levels. Master Xu Yun, enlightenment is pretty remarkable, but not nowhere near Master Xu Yun's level. Okay? Uh, so um, that's, that's the nature of things. Uh, be, that, how do I know that? I saw a few of Master Xu Yun's disciples. And the levels are much lower than Master Xu Yun. That's no surprise because Master Xu Yun, even at his level, doesn't quite know how to train yet. That's why he cannot transfer the knowledge to his disciples. And this explained to me personally, this is why I felt Master Xu Yun had to cultivate by himself and not be obstructed or hindered by Master Xu Yun's limited wisdom. I'm revealing you a lot of secrets about the Chinese Buddhism that the Chinese will not want you to know. They don't want to discuss this, okay? Because they have this reverence of the patriarchs. You know, they are, they are perfect. My, my problem, I don't see them as perfect at all. So that's, you know, that's my curse. Hmm. <sighs> anyway. So, so interestingly, you see, for our sakes, okay, 
Master Shenhua went and got certified so that the rest of us who don't cultivate like that old Vietnamese couple, they don't cultivate. Their level of samadhi is very low. Okay? Uh, but, but, uh, but you need the references so that, so that uh, the Buddhist disciples would know where to look for the proper teaching, the proper dharma. You cannot go wrong. As I just told you, I keep on telling all of you, you go back to Master Shinhua's Dharma, you cannot go wrong. You go to his disciples' level, uh, the bets, all bets are off. Because we have our limitations. We all have our limitations. Okay? Is it clear? Okay? Uh, all right. Uh, 801. And it didn't happen easily for Master Xuanzang when he went from uh, China to India. He was first approached by their Dharma Nature School, okay, and uh, along with all the externalists, because he was like a, a hot stuff Chinese monk. You don't see that many of them, okay. So many of these. Externalist teachers try to to get his interest, and and uh, and Master Xin Zhang knew of the two major schools. So see, that's nature, your blessing. You naturally gravitate towards you. The externalist teachers cannot draw your attention. Okay, and then he's drawn to these two big schools, uh, and he's drawn to one of them, a Dharma Nature School, one of the two big ones. Mm. And he wanted to study with them. And when he heard of their approach, when they were, uh, they, they advocated that he should take some drugs, okay, so that he can live longer, potentially have a chance to live forever, okay, uh, so that he can do more work. But he says, but what if I fail? He says he's not 100% sure that he can live forever with these drugs. If I fail, then I would have uh, uh, failed my mission. And so if I didn't live for long with the drug doesn't work for me, then uh, I would have failed my mission from my emperor. Okay? So that's why he, he, he dropped the Dharma Nature School okay, and went to Dharma Mark School. That's what happened. Okay? And the one thing here, is because, remember, Xuanzang, my great master Xuanzang, was basically ignoring. He didn't know what to choose. And somehow, he's protected by his blessings and guided by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Okay? Hmm. JC. <laughs> So we see we cannot hear you. During the cultivation, we meet the obstruction. Sometimes we overcome the obstruction with the help of teacher. Sometimes we overcome it by ourselves. Is there any difference between them? There's no difference. Obstructions are there to help you cultivate. And uh, fundamentally, you have to learn to deal with it yourself, okay? Uh, There's no shortcuts. 
you have to bear it. You have to endure it. You have to try your best. Okay? Because that's the nature of cultivation. It's like very much like the parents. If the parents are overprotective, then the children will never learn. The children also need to suffer. They also need to try hard themselves. So parents cannot afford to be overprotective, very much like bodhisattvas, bodhisattvas and teachers in Buddhism. Uh, when we teach you, you have to work hard. You have to uh, have the attitude that you have a problem, you have to have to try everything yourselves to fix the problems. And when you have tried everything, mm -hmm. Uh, don't try to, don't, don't, uh, there's no need to pretend, no need to put on a facade. You try your best. And when the time comes, then the teacher will help you. Not before. Okay? Yeah. That's how it works. You don't have to worry about it. This is why, uh, this is why uh, the rule of thumb I gave you, uh, on top of the Chinese system, is that once you found a good no advisor, don't quit. Just hang in there, and you see the miracles. All right? Next, 803. That is that the Buddha first in the deer park turned the Dharma wheel of the four truths for the, mo for the small vehicle, saying that all conditioned dharmas are produced from conditions in order to refute externalists, spontaneous causation, and so forth. Okay. So here on 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 this uh, this uh, this section here um, um, is. Uh, is referred to uh, the, the teachings of Dharma school. Uh, he says, uh, when the Buddha started teaching uh, in the deer park, uh, he started by teaching the Four Noble Truths. Okay? Uh, uh, after he spoke the Flower Dormant, Dormant Sutra for the Bodhisattvas. Okay? Um, and uh, and uh, it happened in Deer Park uh, because this is a, a story uh, that, is, that illustrates how the Dharma is propagated in Buddhism throughout the universe. Okay? Uh, and uh, it happened in Deer Park because Deer Park was where his, uh, his ex five attendants who abandoned him when the Buddha was practicing in the uh, snow mountain. And the five attendants you know, gradually gave up and they all quit and felt that the Buddha was not a good uh, cultivation companion anymore. They all went back to Deer Park to practice. Uh, and and uh, so the Deer Park here in India got, uh, there's a story behind it. Uh, this is where an area, and this is an illustration of things happen over time. Okay, uh, they accumulate, condition arise so that they all converge. And that's how we get together and cultivate. Okay, and we all go back, we all uh, gyrate and keep on spinning around. Okay, and 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 then meet each other again, over and over and over again. Okay, it's not a surprise that we hear, for example, today, yeah, uh, it's not a deer park, because uh, we don't raise deers here. Okay, but deer park is an area where there used to be a lot of deers, and back then, at the, in a long, long time ago, okay, uh, in the same space as India, okay, you know, amazing, way, way, way back then, okay, uh, in when the world was changing and transforming and so forth, a place in India called Deer Park, and a long, long time ago, there used to be a lot of deers, 
Mm. And, and uh, there are uh, two king deers. One was, uh, was Shakyamuni Muni, Muni, uh, king deer, and the other is Devadara. And they each have 500 uh, uh, deers in their herds. Okay, they were coexisting in a deer park, a huge area. And the Indian king at the time loved venison, you know, wild, uh, wild deer meat, and uh, it's nutritious to him. So he liked to, uh, would go hunting and kill deers and eat meat. Okay, in Vietnam, in my, in my time, we go hunting, we take a machine, 50 uh, caliber uh, machine gun, uh, you know, and we drive the Jeep up the mountain. I know this because my, my dad used to do that. And they shine these huge spotlights, okay? And then the deer or the, the game would be frozen by the light. You say, oh, it's, what happened? The sun rose early today? <laughs> and then you take the machine gun. <laughs> it's, it's a machine gun. <laughs> it's a big, big one, 50 caliber. And you know what, 50 caliber. See, uh, see, the gun that you see uh, Clint Eastwood uses is uh, .44. <laughs> this is 50. <laughs> it's a little, a little bit bigger. <laughs> okay? And it's a big machine gun you have to mount it on a Jeep. Okay? And you go, ta -ta 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 -ta. it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, I, I know I'm joking, but it's actually happened because I was, I was told by my father's uh, soldiers they used to do that, okay, in the mountain. And that's what they enjoy doing, okay? Until there's too many Viet Cong in the mountains, <laughs> then they stop. <laughs> because the, the deers don't shoot back. You, the Viet Cong, would, though. So, so anyway. And, and, and so the king loved to hunt so much. It's enjoyable to hunt. I admit, I, hunt, I hunted for a while. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so, the, so it's not just the meat alone, but he was killing a lot of deer. So the two deers got, uh, got together and said, we have to have a plan, otherwise uh, we're gonna lose all our deers before uh, we know it in no time. And so they agreed they would take turn to give a deer to the king per day. And they gave the proposal, uh, Shakyamuni uh, king deer, came in front of the king and made a proposal. And at the time, deers can speak the human language. You see, a lot of conditions are kind of weird. It's not, not the way we used to in our times, okay? But this belief, it's, it's true, okay? So at the time, the deer could speak the human language. He could talk to the king. He understand. He came to the king, and the king said, see, a deer wanted to see me. I got to see this, you know, before I cut the deer, I, before I shoot the deer. Let's talk to the deer first. <laughs> so apparently, uh, the, the Shakyamuni uh, uh, deer king, king deer, um, is a deer king or king deer? <laughs> Uh, uh, could speak both languages. They speak the human language as well as deer language. So he came uh, and, and talked to the king and said, you know, I have a deal for you. If you keep on killing our people, our deers, you have no deers left. Okay? So let's make a deal. Like a deal. I will give you, we give you a, a deer. Okay? We have two herds. We take turn giving you a deer each day. And you can do whatever you want with the deer. Okay? And the king, his king said, oh, it makes sense. Even deers can talk. This is so cool. So for you, I agree, just for the heck of it. You see, so this is why. And so he agreed. And so it was peaceful. Life go on peacefully. So you only use one deer a day. It's not too bad. Deers make a lot of deers. Okay? And so until one day, uh, Shakyamuni, a deer king, uh, king deer, uh, Deer king? No, king deer sounds better. Uh, showed up at the uh, king's palace and said, okay, here's my turn. Go ahead and eat me. Mm. And he said, what happened to you? You're the king, right? I said, yeah. 
but why, why is it your turn? I said, no, it's not my turn. Actually, it's a, it's a girl deer, a doe's turn, but she's pregnant. So she came to me and she said, I don't want to die. I, I can die, it's my turn, yes. You know, but I don't want my child to die. So can you wait? Can you, can you, but I asked someone to take my turn, but no one wants to take my turn. So what to do? So Shakyamuni with a king deer, deer king. Um, <laughs> I got confused. He said, okay, I take your turn for you. You see, the point being that, you know, Master Shion talk about these things, but I want to stress you the lessons here that are forgotten. When you're a king, you're supposed to make sacrifices for your dears. Okay, so he said, it's my turn. Now my chance to make sacrifices. You don't become king just to enjoy being a king. You, you become king because it's a job. It's, they, he takes it very seriously. So that's how later, he, when he became a Buddha, he takes very seriously, you know, being a Buddha. Okay? So it, it starts way back. You see that? The kind of mindset where you guys are trying to get off easy. Right? Master will take care of you. <laughs> Dream on. <laughs> I'm not that kind of master, okay? <laughs> Let's get this straight. <laughs> okay? And so um, I'm nowhere near Shakyamuni Buddha, okay? <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> so anyway, so he came and showed up and said, okay, so I, will, I, was, I will sacrifice for my herd. In contrast, Devadara is the other king. And says, <laughs> he's laughing, oh, what an idiot king. And that's a difference, folks, between wisdom, having wisdom, having blessings. Okay? Like right now, we also have like a quasi two kings in the U.S. as well. Okay? Anyway, yeah, that's not getting to politics. I just got back, and I don't want San Jose people to get upset at me. They're all Republicans. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, Devadara, who is a king, uh, he's only worried about having fun as a king instead of looking at it as a job and taking it seriously. So, so the, the, the dear king uh, uh, gave up himself, gave, up, uh, gave himself up to the king and said, okay, kill me. Uh, my, you know, you, well, as we, we keep our words, my turn, my hurt's turn, no one wants to do it, okay? I do it because it's my, it's my, it's my job. So the king was so impressed. He said, wow, you're a king, and you're a dear king, and you behave better like a king than me as a human king. And for in order to honor your sacrifices and your superior mind, I will give up eating deer meat. You see, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's what happened. Um, and I don't know, I don't have a good story for you why there's so many cows in India. <laughs> but because of that, there's so many deers, the deer multiplied like crazy. And then maybe they became cows or something, who knows. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. See, Murali has a story for, for cows, <laughs> Indian cows. <laughs> yes, sir, too. I think in India back then, I think even my grandmother's home, they always have a, every house will have a cow. They don't have this farm production kind of a thing. So they make, get their own milk and then they used to worship cows too. Yeah. Because they don't eat the cow meat. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why they have so many cows, I guess. Yeah, but in America, we, we, you know, we simply don't eat milk. For milk, we go to neighbors for milk. <laughs> we get the steaks ourselves. <laughs> you see, that's interesting to me is that the Indian are so religious. They really follow their guru's teachings. Hmm? And, and they're told not to kill cows. They don't kill cows. It's very remarkable. 
try to tell the American how to do that. And you see all these Americans here. <laughs> they say, are you joking? This is America, man. All right? Any questions? The point being, folks, is that Shakyamuni Buddha, when he cultivated, is very, very sincere. And it's lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. When he first started, he screwed up royally. But afterwards, uh, his responsibility increased. He became outstanding. There's long history of sacrifices. It's remarkable. Okay? That's why he influenced so many people. It's not just himself. Okay? But he also had, you know, his wife, his uh, attendants, and so forth. He has, you know, countless people who, who were impressed by his examples. And he's, he still doesn't stop. He does more and more and more. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. Yeah. And that king there, it turns out be later, because his, that king was converted, he was so impressed by the, the, the king deer that he later uh, believed in making sacrifices that nature of cultivation. is actually Ashnata Kondinya, one of the uh, Buddha's disciples, major disciples. All right? Mm -hmm. We are on slide 816. So, after speaking the Flower Dwarman Sutra, uh, Buddha went to a deer park to cross over Ashnata Kondinya and the other uh, uh, four bhikshus. He turned the Dharma wheel for the small vehicle of the four truths of suffering, accumulation, extinction, and the way. Okay, here's, here's, here's what uh, the Buddha had to do. Back then in India, there were Excuse me, a lot of non-Buddhist teachers who were real popular back then was that uh, the spon spon spontaneous causation, meaning things happen because they happen. No really, no real reason for it. It just happened. It rained, so it rained. Uh, if there's an earthquake, it's because it's an earthquake spontaneously. Okay? No rhyme or reason. And the Buddha said, this is wrong, uh, because it's, that's, uh, that's a deviant belief. Uh, in Buddhism, the, in the truth of the universe, it says cause and effect. It happened because there's a reason for it. There's a cause for it, okay, that made it happen. Uh, and so uh, that's why, um, because, uh, because there were a lot of uh, externalists, followers, including the five attendants, including himself, before he became a Buddha. He was also an externalist. So Buddha was very, very, uh, very knowledgeable, knows, knew very well uh, these teachings. So he said, in, what's the best way to take advantage of the externalist teachings and cultivations and show them, uh, put them on the proper path quicker? So that's what he invented, Agama Sutras. He taught the small vehicle sutras, okay, which is so appealing to the externalists that many of his early disciples were externalists. All right? And these externalists back then have two views, a permanence and an annihilationism, meaning that permanence, meaning that if you are a human uh, now, forever, you'll always be a human until the end of time, which is wrong, meaning that uh, it doesn't matter what you do, you always become a human. Mm. I guarantee you, most Republicans will have a hard time. As a warning to you, <laughs> my devoted followers, <laughs> just 
Just kidding. You guys are so sensitive. <laughs> okay? And an annihilationism, meaning that it doesn't matter. Everything returns to dust. Okay? Now, you human, after we cremate you, we just spread you in the wind, throw you in the wind, and you go, come, go back to dust. So it doesn't matter at all what you do. It carries no consequences. Now, that's wrong. That is very wrong. But it's very prevalent back then. Actually, my own older brother, who's very wealthy, mind you, believes in permanence, um, believes in, in uh, annihilationism. He says, it doesn't matter anyway. Let's enjoy ourselves. Let's, let's do the best. Let's con people and make a lot of money as long as we can get away with it. That's the American way, you know? And he's very successful. Except that he's going to be a very sick dude. <laughs> oh, never mind. And carries a price, folks. You cheat people, you hurt people, you pay. Sooner or later. Big time, multiple times, not just this lifetime, but many, many more lifetimes. Yes, JC. Amitofo Master. Um, He's still there. Wait a minute. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Master. So um, I have one question. So. How did the Buddha create the Saha world, but at the same time he became a Buddha in the Saha world? Okay, help me. Uh, Spanish accent. I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe I can say it clearly. Is it better now? Uh, I think uh, Nacho said, asked, how did the Buddha create the Saha world and then become the Buddha in the Saha world? It's kind of a six, catch 69 for. That's catch 22, not 69. <laughs> Sorry, wrong place. <laughs> Your math have problems. <laughs> <clears throat> it's an American joke, you Koreans. You see, the Koreans are not even laughing. Only the Chinese understand. <laughs> Let's not go there. I'm not going there, okay? Don't ask. <laughs> Jumi, is Jumi there? Jumi, don't ask me. You're going to be sorry if you ask me. Anyway, uh, so how can Buddha uh, create the Saha world and, and then come back to it, right? And keep on coming back? Okay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead, one. Someone help me out. Well, at least no batteries. I'm sorry, I'm not really helping uh, Nacho Macho, but I just don't understand what's wrong with creating Saha world and coming back again and again. I don't... No, the point is that, you know, Buddha, uh, and see, he, he says, Buddha's created the Saha world already when he became a Buddha. So when he come back again, does he, does he need to create another world? Is that, is that the nature of your question, uh, uh, Nacho? Yes, yes. Hmm. Okay. Does he need to create another world? Yes, eight. Amitofo, Master. Um, didn't he create 
the Saha world when he spoke the Avantamsaka Sutra for the first time? No. Because he taught everybody the Four Noble Truths as well, and that was not known before him. No? So, no. No. He didn't create before. Nacho is right. Shakyamuni Buddha did not create a Saha world. But he came. The answer is very simple. Once you create it, then the next time around you don't have to create anymore. <laughs> Isn't it obvious? It's like, it's like Buddhists also have a checklist, Nacho. Okay? That's a checklist. I say, at the very moment, moment that he became a Buddha, okay, his iPhone pinged him. He said, ping! <laughs> the checklist came. It says, first, okay, you speak Avatam Saka Sutra. That's number two. Okay? Number one is, first create the Saha world. But the Saha world has been checked. It's been created already, so check. The next speaks Flower Adornment Sutra. All right? Don't have to do it again. Yes, DTT. Hello, Master. Welcome back. Uh, is this uh, uh, something about when Buddha creates Saha world? It's uh, uh, with and then when he became the Shakyamuni Buddha in this world, it's his transformation body. Yeah. So, so transformation bodies can you know can create worlds too. Yeah, so I think match. Uh, I think natural's question was more about you cannot create something that uh, contains yourself. I, that's how I understood it. So yeah. even Buddha did the creation. Buddha born into it. It's a different bodies. No, let me explain this to you. Sao world residence. <laughs> Before the Sao world, let me, let me put it this way for you. Before the Sao world was created, Shakyamuni Buddha was in a different world. He was cultivating. And when he said, when he was not a Buddha yet, he says, when I become a Buddha, what's going to happen? I want a world called Saha. And I have to decide whether it's going to be impure world or pure world, pure land or impure land. And at the time he chose it to, he prefers it to be impure land. So he was, he was not a Buddha yet, and he, he started creating that world already. He started preparing for it already. Okay? And so he started investing in earth, in water, you know, buying into AI stocks and so forth. Bitcoins? Would you prefer Bitcoins? Never mind. Okay, so he started investing already. It beginning is preparing. So, and when he became a Buddha, okay, it takes a long time to prepare, by the way. When he became a Buddha, then poof, out from nowhere, Sahar appeared in the universe. Just like that, okay? Mm. And that's when it was created, okay? And then he came. Now the world is created, he can come and go when, when, as he pleases. Does it help? You don't have to create the world right away as soon as you become a Buddha. You, you, you know, and you have to, you know, it, it, it's, it's not how it works. You first create the world. You bring people there, and then you wait until it's time to teach, you know, the Indians. Then you become, you go to India. And then later on, you know, later on, uh, in the future, you know, He'll go to a different country in a Sahara world. That's how it works. Does it help? Okay. See, you scientists are just too detailed. 
I'm glad I read it somewhere. <laughs> uh, yes, JMT. Ah, excuse me, of course. <laughs> 마스터께서 예전에 언젠가 말씀하셨는데 부처가 되면 정토를 만들지 예토를 만들지를 결정해서 중생을 제도한다고 하셨거든요. 그러니까 석가모니 부처님께서 저, 예, 어, 예토를 만드셔서 사바 세계를 만드셔서 여기 사바 기주로서 중생을 제도하고 계시는 걸로 저는 나초 나초의 질문을 그렇게 이해했습니다. Master, I remember that you said that uh, when uh... We become Buddha. We decide whether we made the world to pure land or impure land. So for Shakyamuni Buddha, he made a impure land, and then he he made it for the li saving living beings. That's what I understand. He made what an imp uh, impure land, and then what? Like and he saved living beings. And he saved living beings. Yeah, so is there a question? No, it's her comment. Her comment. Oh, good comment, good comment. Yes, seven. Um, Master, before he became a Buddha, wasn't he in Tushira heaven, inner court, awaiting to be a Buddha? Was there Saha world is already created then? <sighs> I'm going to lose my temper, so <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there. What do you want from me? <laughs> Ay, yeah, yeah. Yes, nine. Answer each other. <laughs> uh, can I shift topic for a, a bit and ask, well, going back to kind of the teachings of the previous um, slide, uh, how, what is the proper way, Master, to understand dependent, co-arising, or however we uh, say that term? Dependent arisal, which basically cause and effect. That's all. Meaning that you, uh, something happens because of another, there's a cause for it. So therefore, for something to happen, for example, for you to become rich, for example, that has to be the fact that you have created blessings for you, for yourselves already. That's why you're rich now. If you didn't create blessings in the past, there's no way for you to become rich. So that's codependent arisal. Arisal is, this arisal is that you're being a rich person, okay? Dependent, it depends on something else. It's not, it's not spontaneous. In the past, we uh, had a previous conversation some, like many months ago, and um, we were talking about chance and randomness, and you explained clearly that that term is just, you know, um, a worldly term, but there is the, and you use Vietnamese, I don't know what the word is in English, but to explain that there are things upon things that build on it, and the reasons for what we call randomness is too complex to understand. That's right. Is that the same term or different? That's right. Vietnamese go trung trung duyen khởi, meaning there's the avatamsaka concept where all the causes and conditions are actually layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. That's why it's never random. We cannot see, that's why we call it random. But in Buddhism, the Buddha has wisdom, folks, is that he can see one cause leading to the next, the next, the next. He can see, he can backtrack all the way to the very beginning. That's the Buddha's wisdom. That's why he says, no such thing as randomness. It's only codependent arisal, and it's all chung chung yuan qi, meaning that it is layers upon layers of yuan qi arisal from conditions. But there are infinite layers, if you will. That's why it appears to be random, but it's not. 
It's so scientific that even the scientists cannot see. That's Buddha's wisdom. Isn't that incredible? You scientists think it's random. Buddha says, no, it's not. Because he can see it, the connection. Yes, Seven. Thank you, Master. Um, we have a comment from Samson Lau. Amitabha, Master, is it correct that every Buddha has a pure land? In that case, is there a pure land in the Saha world that is much closer to us? Don't we wish. The Saha world is not a pure land. To us, it's not a pure land. What we see, we're, as we residents of the Saha world, we see our world as impure, meaning that we, as we encounter people with the three poisons everywhere. Look around. You. Poison, poison, poison. And this is amazing on that airplane trip back here. What I didn't tell you is that where it's fully booked because they merge a lot of from different flights into one flight. Okay. They pack us in like sardines. Okay. And so uh, so there's no empty seats at all. When you fly nowadays, you can get, do a check-in online, get seats assignment online, you better do it very quickly because you get the aisle seats and window seats. No one wants the middle seats. And so because of plane fully packed, the, all the middle seats were taken as well by the time that we, we, uh, we boarded. And there's an there's a, uh, a Asian gentleman uh, who's uh, who's uh, his, in his uh, 50s or early 60s, he was so afflicted because he sat next uh, to XX. Okay, it's the middle row. So his XX is sitting here on the middle row and I'm sitting on the aisle row. Okay, so we are like uh, uh, just across the aisle and he sat next to her and he saw me talking to her, okay? And he was his face, he says, uh, after he observed it for a few minutes, he talked to her and said, you know, would you, would, wouldn't, he, wouldn't he want to come sit here next to you? And my first reaction is, I don't know her. <laughs> I don't know her that well to be that close to her. <laughs> and he was so afflicted because he's packed. He feels so crampy. Next to him is an, a Thai person, and then, and then, then this nun here, you know, and no hair, you know. You know. And, 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 uh, and so he was so afflicted. It shows in the face. This is what I see everywhere I go. Earlier in, in, in the Chan class, I told you I, I hate people, but I find you funny because look at your affliction. Afflicted, 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 afflicted. <laughs> I find it so funny. Why are you so afflicted? Okay? So it's, this, he was so awfully afflicted that his shows in his forehead, his eyes, everything is so afflicted. He doesn't know what to do. He was so upset. Okay? And I was telling uh, Master XX, I said, my God, people don't realize that they're poisoning the atmosphere. When you afflict that afflicted, when you eat lunch with me, you're poisoning me. When you sit next to me and I'm eating my airplane thing, okay, you're poisoning my food. You realize that? When you afflict it and you cook for me, I eat your affliction. You know that. I taste your affliction. Your food tastes horrible. I'm being blunt with you. I used to have a lot of people who are afflicted who cook for me. And every day, every lunch is like poison for me. It tastes so bad. <laughs> okay? And, and so people don't realize that this is, this is, this is our real life. When you're afflicted, okay, you're poisoning the one who's next to you. Folks, wake up. I see it every time. I see affliction, affliction. I say, oh my God, how can people live like this? Go ahead, JMT. Uh, 
Hello, Master. Um, Hola. Relating to Nacho. Uh, uh, I think. Sound like he's having a flu, huh? Uh, light. Flu, well, yes. light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni Buddha says that he uh, actually became a Buddha millions of, of eons ago, and uh, since then he has been coming to this Saha world and manifesting, becoming a Buddha, but uh, he doesn't say in which world he became a Buddha. So scientifically speaking, he could have created this Saha world. Scientifically speaking, it's all over oh, the universe. Know what it's Buddhas are not restricted to the Saha world, by the way. It's yours restricted to the Saha world. But Shakyamuni Buddha went to so many worlds throughout the universe to do his work. Not just the Saha world alone. You know why? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, no. No. I. I answered no. The same way I had to go to uh, Kland. If I sit here and wait for the Korean to come, uh, it will never happen. <laughs> See, in a small scale, we go to where uh, the work is. Okay. Uh, anyone else? We have a few more minutes. Very good. Let's end early today. All right. Let's be bold. Enough cultivation. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Let's do a rebirth transference. Thanks a lot. See you next time. <laughs>